Thank you for joining us. The following presentation is from a webinar titled Fraud Prevention and Detection, Surprise Fraudsters Before They Surprise You, originally produced on October 17th, 2013. The presenters are Sam Bowercraft and David Hammerberg with McConley and Asbury. Enjoy the presentation and visit us online at www.macpas.com for more information about our future events and upcoming webinars. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm used to in-person presentations more often than webinars, so it's a little different for me, but uh, hopefully everything will go well. and. We'll have a good session this afternoon. Hope you're all doing well. Um, my name is Sam uh, Bowercraft, and I'm here with Dave Hammerberg. Say hello, Dave. Good afternoon. Um, we're excited to present to you today. Uh, normally, I uh, present and introduce myself, but I always feel that's weird, so I'm going to have Dave introduce me first. So, Dave, tell everyone about me. Uh, we just hired Sam today um, for this <laughs> webinar. Thanks, no. Dave. Just joking. Anyway, uh, Sam, I've worked with Sam for several years uh, in the fraud environment, uh, working with uh, various clients. And I just wanted to introduce him. He uh, holds a master's degree in information systems, as well as a bachelor of science degree in chemical engineering. He is a senior manager with our risk management services group here at McConley and Asbury. He also does some strategic planning for uh, enterprises. Um, he does risk security vulnerability assessments, works in our fraud department, disaster recovery, and the list goes on. Thanks, Dave. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Dave here. Uh, and just to clarify, I don't work in our fraud department. I work in our fraud risk management department. <laughs> um, Dave is our director of IT here. He's also a senior manager. He's a CPA. Uh, he's uh, has several certifications in information system security as well as uh, Microsoft certification. And he is a certified fraud examiner as well. He heads up a lot of our fraud investigations and fraud risk assessment work. Uh, he likes his technology and he likes to hunt a great deal. So they will be filling us in on any hunting tips he may have later as well. Right, Dave? Excellent. Excellent. We'll uh, dig right into the material today. I will remind everyone uh, as we're as we're talking, if you have questions or thoughts, uh, comments that you want to bring up, uh, feel free to use the interface to post them and we'll address them as they come up or when appropriate. Uh, hopefully we can get some interaction and um, make things a little more personable for you during the session. Uh, as you know, McConley and Asbury is a, a regional audit tax firm. We also have a risk management section. Um, we focus on fraud risk management as well as internal controls and internal audit. Uh, we're central Pennsylvania based and we've been around for 40 years and we're looking forward to the next 40 as well. Uh, this session we're going to be covering a variety of topics uh, specifically around fraud. Uh, we're going to talk about some basics of fraud uh, just to give everyone a, a solid background. Uh, we'll talk about auditing a little bit because it's, it's kind of relevant with regard to fraud and prevention and detection. And then we'll be discussing uh, surprise audits and how they can fit into the overall fraud detection and prevention scheme and some considerations for your environment and company. Uh, we're going to kick things off with a poll uh, just to try and keep things interactive. So our first poll, uh, just to warm everyone up, is when do you think winter holiday decoration decorations should be permitted to be put up? Uh, obviously, there's a variety of answers here, and we'd love to hear what you think. So please answer the poll and we'll get some responses. Everyone's clicking away and it's clicked up and let's see. So looks like everyone says after Thanksgiving, 70% November's okay. Apparently there are a couple people who think any time of the year after Valentine's day is fine. And then uh, actually we have 10% who believe that two weeks of Christmas decorations or holiday decorations are okay. Excellent. Good to see that everybody knows how to use the mouse. And we're going to move on to one more poll. Are we doing another poll now? We are indeed. Our second poll is actually relevant to the topic at hand. And we'd like to know what your general experience with fraud is. Just to get a background of, of what experience you've had. Have you been at a company during a fraud occurrence? Uh, did you ever participate in a fraud investigation? 
or have you fortunately had a, no opportunity to be involved in fraud? Unfortunately, we left off one option. That was if you committed fraud, but I guess we'll just uh, leave that alone. Uh, we did We did have one individual who already submitted the fact that he was a fraud, sir, but uh, I believe he was joking. But we'll be following up with that employee shortly. <laughs> um, we did have some answers, and it looks like about half people have Half the group have participated in a fraud investigation with about 40% not having any experience, and I'm very happy for those people, and then about 16% been at a company during a fraud investigation. Great. Thanks for the feedback. We'll uh, carry on. I think it's interesting to get that sort of feedback because it helps everyone to know where other people have experienced or seen fraud, whether they've been at a company where it's occurred or whether they've just been involved in fraud investigations. Um, there's three different types of fraud, just to cover basically financial statement fraud, and that has to do with reporting and misrepresenting numbers on financial statements. Misallocation of assets, it's another way of saying stealing, um, but that can include taking inventory or taking cash or transferring money. And information technology fraud, um, this is, of course, a, a growing area of concern, considering that most businesses and companies run everything off information technology, and the data and information within your organization is really where you bank and are able to perform your business. It allows you to be successful and to make good decisions. And if you don't have, if that information isn't protected or you don't aren't certain of the integrity of that data, it can definitely be a potential area for issues. Uh, the fraud triangle, um, if you've ever been to a fraud presentation, you've probably seen this triangle. If not, uh, welcome to the fraud triangle. There are three things that must be present for fraud to occur, and understanding and recognizing these three areas is vital to preventing fraud and being aware of how it can occur. Uh, you must have some sort of pressure. Most people have a level of pressure in their lives that make them to make them do or behave in a certain way, do things. Um, everyone needs money and a pressure for more money or a pressure to have financial statements or financial metrics that much, must be met may pressure someone into performing fraudulent actions or fraudulent behavior. Uh, those pressures can change from day to day. And it's important to note that you, as an employer or manager or supervisor, you can never know the level of pressure another person is experiencing from day to day because you, you're you not with them all the time. You can't see everything they're doing or know everything they're experiencing. Uh, they may have a gambling issue. That's usually a, a, a softball. Oh, they had a gambling issue. They needed more money. That was their pressure. But it could be a pressure related to uh, a sickness in the family or a spouse lost their job and they need more money. Or it can be a pressure to perform at a high level within the organization and have good financial statements. Second side of the triangle is rationalization. Um, after a person has a pressure, they need to rationalize why it's okay to commit fraud. Um, obviously, if it's a family member who needs money to for an operation so that they can live, uh, they can rationalize in that regard. Um, other rationalizations include, well, I work hard, but I'm not paid well enough for the work I do, or my boss doesn't adequately um, reward me for the work I've done and the extra effort that I've done, um, or, well, they have plenty of money and they should share the wealth, so I'll just take some for myself. Um, pressure and rationalization wax and wane within any person, and it's difficult to measure and judge. Um, so those are sort of shadow aspects of the fraud triangle. The third part of the triangle which is really the only part of the triangle that you can minimize is opportunity to commit fraud within your organization. Uh, if you lock all the doors and windows, then no one can steal from you. And limiting the opportunity, either through locking the doors and preventive controls or monitoring and reviewing other people's activities, um, minimizes and reduces that opportunity so that uh, fraud can't be performed. It's important to note that while you can minimize opportunity, it is pretty much impossible to remove all opportunity. Um, if 
you wanted to remove all opportunity, you could do that, but you would spend so much money and time doing so that you put yourself out of business. So you have to balance how much control you put into place with how much, uh, what the value of that effort is. I would also add that with rationalization, um, you can't minimize it, but it often comes to the tone at the top. You know, if you have a, a boss that's stealing or, or you know, um, just the tone at the top is more apt to, you know, um, expenses that really aren't for the company, stuff like that, you know, the employee is going to feel like, oh, that's okay. So um, rationalization can't be minimized, but I think you can, a company can do a good job in um, helping prevent the rationalization that, oh, my boss is doing it. It's okay for me. Right. I, that's well said, Dave. Uh, with regard to bad actors, fraudsters, um, they're always looking for opportunity. They're, they're going to be aware of it. They're going to be working day to day doing their general work activities, but they're also going to be sensing and detecting and evaluating their opportunities. So as I said, when there's no control or oversight, uh, trust without verification, as Dave just mentioned, good governance is key with that regard to oversight. Um, oversight without diligence, inadequate verification. Uh, just asking someone if they did something is not adequate. Um, you need some sort of evidence to rely on to ensure that people are doing what they said they did. Um, part of it can be a culture issue. We'll talk about culture issues a little bit more later. Excessive trust or a disinterest in supporting a controlled environment. If, as Dave mentioned, with governance, if management at the top isn't interested in making sure that there's an effort to control the environment, um, that's going to trickle down and you're going to see it at uh, subsequent levels. Matt, I see it as, you know, there's two kind of fraudsters out there. There's one that, you know, they're coming to your business and that's what they did at the last business and the last business before that. And they're there to look for an opportunity to steal or, you know, take assets, et cetera. And then you have the other individual that really didn't mean to steal, but he has the opportunity. You know, he needs $20 for this and that. And he means to bring pay it back, but it, it just gets bigger and bigger and it snowballs. So I think, you know, we're, the, the company has to provide the least amount of opportunity for that fraudster. I mean, we don't want an honest person to be tempted, I guess. I mean, we want to bring that temptation down to the least, least amount. Absolutely. And uh, Vicki has a good comment. She has also learned that the perception of detection is a great way to prevent fraud. Uh, if people perceive that they'll be detected, um, they are less likely to take action. Uh, not unlike children who are going after the cookie jar, if they always perceive that their parents are watching, they're, they're not going to go after it, usually. I mean, we've installed fake cameras and et cetera in different places, like ice cream parlors, stuff like that. And that really, uh, you know, the little fake blinking light does make a difference. Well said. Uh, we're going to do one more poll. There's only 44 of these, so we only have to get work. Through. I'm just kidding. There's, I think, six. Uh, what do you think is the best way to catch fraud? Uh, use internal auditors, use external auditors, or use a hotline or other reporting mechanism, or uh, due to technical difficulties, we have strong control environment was the fourth one, but uh, apparently I can't copy and paste well. So, um, so it looks like about 80% of people think a hotline and strong control environment are the best way to go. Um, that's very true. Many, many frauds, a majority of them are actually caught or, uh, the, yeah, caught through a hotline or external reporting mechanism. And that includes allowing employees, customers, and vendors access to that hotline. Uh, so it's, uh, it can be an excellent investment, um, based on the size of your company and environment. I mean, I think over the last several years, we've done you know, many fraud investigations, and I would say probably 95% of those have come from, um, you know, the company or employee bringing it to our attention as opposed to an actual audit. All right, so we're going to move on to um, the purpose of auditing. Uh, most people think that auditing has a variety of purposes depending on your experience with it. Um, the actual defined purpose is to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of risk management, control, and governance processes. And it's important 
to, to really focus on this because I think that audit gets a bad rap from time to time. People have different perspectives. But really the purpose of auditing is to evaluate and improve. That, that's really key. And when we talk about fraud, what we're really doing is trying to prevent fraud by evaluation and trying to uh, then detect it as well. Um, auditing seeks to determine why activities are performed, why are you doing this stuff, how are they being performed, and how do we meet business objectives in that regard. Uh, understanding and focusing on that purpose is very important. Um, we want to verify the right things are being done. We want to evaluate processes for effectiveness and efficiency. You know, is the process really doing what we want it to? Auditing is to provide an independent assessment. Sometimes we get caught in the weeds. We're doing our day-to-day -day tasks. We're monitoring things. And uh, we have a tendency, all of us, by our human nature, to think, well, I'm, I must be doing the right things because I'm doing these things, and not to go back and reevaluate. Sometimes it's good to have an independent view of that. Uh, audits, auditors are really there to make work with management to make things better. And... Uh, and this is a detection strategy. Well, what did you do? How did you do it? Show me evidence. And that evidence is very important, not only from a, from a concrete standpoint, but it helps people to make sure that they're doing the right things when they have to produce evidence to say, well, I actually did this. And apparently I can't use the mouse correctly. There we go, got it, all right. All right, so the purpose of Process auditing is not to punish the guilty or innocent with a rain of fire, brimstone, and guilt. That was Dave's. Um, mine was to strike fear into the hearts of men and women. And then uh, Reed, who you heard earlier, said it is not to demonstrate a lack of trust in employees within the company. These are not the, pro the purpose of process auditing. And it's important to note these. Whenever we're talking about anything, it's important to know what our purpose is and what our purpose is not. And I think that frequently the experience of auditees is... Their perspective is it's one of these things or a combination of all three. And communicating and sharing with them and employees across all levels that, you know, we're here to make things better. You know, are you doing the right stuff? Because it's for the benefit of not only an area, but for everyone is, is an important approach to make auditing successful. Um, and especially when we're talking about fraud auditing, it's even more important to ensure that you're communicating the purpose of the audit. You know, we're, we're not here to punish everybody. We're here to find out what actually happened so we can improve it in the future. Um, and having that perspective and communicating it is vital to the success of the process. Um, and uh, that's what I just said. So. It's too bad I didn't print these slides out ahead of time and have them right here with me, Dave. Yeah, that is a problem. I see you did that. That was very good. <laughs> um, now let's talk about surprise because we're going to talk about surprise audits here for, uh, shortly. Um, surprise is to encounter suddenly or unexpectedly, to take or catch unawares. Um, I like the second definition a little bit better. Surprise occurs when what happens does not match our expectations. And... You know, if someone jumps out from behind a door, um, we're surprised because we we took them unaware. We encountered them suddenly and we scare someone. Uh, but it's also important to note that surprise is about a mismatch of expectation. And even when we do regular audits, I think that there's frequently a mismatch of expectation. What's the purpose of the audit? And the purpose from the auditor's perspective and the purpose from the auditee's perspective can be very different. And that is a surprise to people. Um, but when we talk about using surprise in this case, what we want to do is we want to use it to shake people out of a complacent state. Um, if we were all in one room, I would do a straw poll, but I would say, think to yourself, when was the last time you really evaluated uh, the fraud risks within your company? Was it in the past year? Was it in the past two years? Was it in the past three years? Or was it longer than that? Um, a complacent state is very easy to occur 
because it takes a great deal of dil diligence and vil vigilance to continuously come back and revisit policies, risk assessments, processes. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? It's very easy to say, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do X because that's what we need to do right now. And then next year to not go back and say, well, why are we doing X? Oh, uh, well, that still applies. Well, does it really apply or has have things changed a little bit or a lot? Um, so shaking people out of a complacent state uh, can be good for the organization. It can be good for individuals um, and it can be good for everybody. It can also be surprising. Surprise audits have a little bit of a different purpose. To evaluate and improve, it's the same, but without providing notice of the review so that preparation cannot be performed by the auditee. It's, it's a surprise. We still want to confirm operational readiness of a process area, but the, uh, with the, in the case of a surprise audit, what we actually want to do is, is confirm its true operational readiness. There's a difference between telling your son or daughter that they need to keep their room clean and that if it's clean when you check on it next week that you'll give them ten dollars but you can probably guarantee that their room is more likely than not going to be clean because they know that you're going to check it on friday and if it's clean on friday they'll get ten bucks uh it's completely different when you say well sometime in the next week i'll be checking your room to see if it's clean and that could be after you go to school, it could be before you go to bed, it could be in 10 minutes. But if they don't know when you're going to check up on them, when you do check up on them, you're going to find out whether or not they were truly prepared. And that allows for a, a true operational evaluation. Now, the audit itself is a detection strategy. You know, we're, we're looking back and seeing how things were working. But the possibility of an audit, the as, as Vicky mentioned earlier, the possibility of the audit is a prevention strategy. The, the pending evaluation that may occur tomorrow or a month or six months away, but it could happen at any time, that, that is a prevention strategy to ensure that people are staying focused and doing what they need to do right away at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me, I was going to take a drink. Dave, take over. Some surprise audit basics. Uh, purpose, <clears throat> scope. I'll let Sam go ahead from there. <laughs> I finished drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's important to note that surprise audits don't really have a lot uh, different from a standard audit. You still have a purpose and scope. Um, we still have standards and procedures for the audit. You still want to have test procedures in an area you're going to review. Uh, you're going to identify your audit team members and schedule. And you're also going to have defined final report expectations. Um, the only main difference is the amount of time the auditee is notified prior to the audit. We, we don't change anything in the process except instead of saying, well, you know, you're on the audit schedule and we'll see you in April. It's, well, you may be on the audit schedule and at some point we are going to audit you. Um, or you might even say, uh, payroll will be audited this year, and we will let you know when that's going to occur uh, one day beforehand. And that allows for a sense of surprise, but it also sets a, an expectation that, well, I will be audited, and I need to be ready at any time. Again, the preventive strategy so that people know that these things uh, are coming down the line. I'm just checking my notes here. Um, oh, here we go. That's on the next slide. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, surprise audit benefits include, well, no one expects a surprise audit. Uh, if you ever watch Monty Python, Dave, did you ever watch Monty Python? I know you don't own yeah. a television. <laughs> um, uh, but no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, was uh, what I was going to put there. Um, it forces a state of readiness at all times. And fraud is more frequently caught via this type of audit. Again, we're talking about expectations. If, if you have a bad actor, if you have a fraudster who's committing fraud, if you set their expectations about, and, and you, you will set their expectations about their job and what they do, 
but you also set their expectations about when you're reviewing their work and how how the quality of, of that review. If the fraudster recognizes that they have an opportunity to commit fraud and they start committing fraud, they have an expectation that you're going to continue to not monitor them well and that you will. And then when if they have an expectation that an audit is coming, they know that in July, when the audit comes, they'll have plenty of time to get ready for it because they know July 7th is when the kickoff meeting is and they can prepare for the audit. Sam, a question for you. Yep. Do you think that surprise audits should be done more for from internal audit standpoint or an external audit, or what's your feeling on that? Um, my sense of that is that an internal audit approach in general is better because with the external auditors usually are financial statement auditors and they have a very clear focus on that, whereas the internal auditors are usually process focused. As well, the internal auditors work with management to set their audit schedule with the audit committee from the board. Um, as such, internal audit will have a better sense of where, what those areas they need to focus on. Additionally, they will need to, uh, they can make recommendations to the audit committee and the board and management about what areas might be best for the surprise audits. And uh, we'll talk about those in a little bit too. Sounds good. Um, and as I said, it, Fraud is more frequently caught via this type of audit because you have shaken up the expectations of your bad actors and fraudsters. Um, another, an example of, of changing expectations in this way is, uh, is also a fraud prevention tactic, which is having employees who are normally dedicated to payroll, let's say, and accounts payable, and having them switch roles so that, or having different roles switch within the accounting department. In that way, um, if you have a bad actor who is doing something, uh, when the new person steps in and starts doing this other person's job, they're going to start asking questions about why is this money missing or why these checks haven't these checks been deposited or these inventory accounts haven't been done. Um, again, it's changing up expectation and it allows for um, a reduction in opportunity and the perception that they will be discovered. Uh, areas to focus on, uh, as we were just talking about, um, these are high-risk areas for fraud just in general, and as a result, surprise audits are these are these areas are ripe for surprise audits. Uh, payroll, uh, accounts payable, inventory, and then any other key internal control areas. Um, if you have someone who, for example, is in charge of uh, a certain type of compliance or environmental protection. And there might be an opportunity for them to take advantage of internal controls in order to make some money by improperly disposing of hazardous waste, for example. Um, that's a key internal control area. That would be a high-risk area for your organization if you were in, in hazardous waste removal. Understanding and recognizing those risk areas would be key to identifying those areas where you want to say, well, you know, a surprise audit in this area may not hurt. And it would also make sure that... Uh, you know, if you're talking about hazardous waste material removal, um, it it would be a, a matter of reputation as well. If you have concern over your reputation in hazardous waste removal, uh, might be a good area to make sure that they're on their toes all the time. Uh, you're not talking about misallocation of assets. You're talking about the reputation of the company and maybe even uh, the ability of the company to operate, uh, which is key. So uh, let's make sure everybody's happy. We're going to do another poll. Um, let's see, which poll are we going to do? Yeah. Nope. No, it's the next one. Yep. So uh, what do you think is the best way to prevent fraud? A strong control environment? This is key. To prevent fraud, strong control environment, internal, external audits, or anti-fraud training and tone from the top. All right, everybody's clicking away. I have to keep. I have to remember to keep talking. I have a good friend who's in radio. He says, "Don't don't let there be dead air." All right, looks like everybody's clicked in. Looks like about seventy percent think a strong control environment's the way to go, and with about a little under thirty percent saying anti-fraud training and tone from the top. Or, uh, and it, it's it's all three of these absolutely. Um, they they all play a part, and it's important that uh, a defense in depth strategy is important. Uh, when we talk about information systems security, we talk about defense in depth. It's the same with fraud. You have to have good governance. You have to have good solid internal controls. 
and you have to have some sort of review. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Surprise audits work just like regular audits. Uh, they aren't going to change in their in their structure, as we mentioned before. Um, it's important, you know, we talk about risk assessment. I don't know that anybody could be more tired of talking about risk assessment, but the reality is it is a vital and important aspect of risk <coughs> management. Dave, you all right? I'm good. He's good. All right. Um, if you don't assess your risks, then you don't know where you need to focus your efforts. We don't have unlimited resources. As such, we need to know where to apply our resources. Um, so management needs to risk assess and identify key areas of risk. You need to do it at least annually. If you do it more often, that's great, but you need to reevaluate your risk every year. If you don't think that your risk environment is changing year over year, then you are either in a very protected industry or um, you may want to reconsider your position uh, because things change over time. You know, if you don't think the economy is not changing, it, it is. I mean, well, it depends on how you look at it, but things are changing outside of your company and redoing your risk assessment is vital to keep up with those changes. Um, randomizing surprise audits is a must to keep readiness in all areas. If you do a surprise audit of payroll every March, then it's not a surprise. Um, that, that doesn't count. Um, but it also means that you need to surprise other areas as well. Uh, if you always do surprise audits over cash and you never surprise audit anyone else, um, again, you're setting expectations that, well, surprise audits are really only done in this one area. Um, and you're reducing the effectiveness of the tool. Um, so it takes some planning and consideration. And just as we do risk assessments every year, we need to reevaluate how we're doing surprise audits, where we're doing them, and when we're doing them. There's no cookie cutter approach, I think, to the surprise audit and to figuring out your risk. You know, every fraud engagement we go into, uh, there's n never been one that's been alike. And the risks associated, you know, we'll go in and determine, you know, Obviously, we've been called in and, and they know of some theft, but we got to go in and we look at all of the internal controls and then we look at what um, controls are working and then the risks based on those internal controls, you know, what could, could happen. And then we look at the overall picture as well as where the theft is just so that we can kind of, you know, grab anything that's, you know, in that area. So if it's payroll fraud, we'll like it, look at the whole payroll function. And I think for each individual company, you got to make sure that you look at your particular risks. Um, you know, the company down the road may be similar to yours, but have totally different risks. So it's, uh, it's, you really have to dive into uh, knowing your risks. Okay. Uh, absolutely, Dave. Completely agree. We're going to do another poll. Uh, how do you think your company would react to a surprise audit right now? Um, this is a important question because as we change how we behave or operate, it's going to impact uh, how how our culture and our people react and how they operate as well. So let's see, um, everybody's clicking in. This polling thing is really cool. I need to, I need to use this. Reed, Reed's helping us out here on the tech side. Reed, I want to set this up for every one of our future in-person presentations. So you make that happen. He said, yes. All right. It looks like 61% said it would be a surprise, but it would be taken in stride. That's, that's, that's excellent. 11% said surprise, shock, and awe. 13% uh, said surprise, shock, and anger. And 15% said surprise, shock, and a small revolt. You know, um, you, know, you know, it's funny because when fraud occurs, you know, the biggest 90% of people are surprise, shock, and anger. But, you know, if you ask them then if we a surprise audit would have helped, yes. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's got to be taken in stride and... Um, you can't dwell on one person. You know, if, if, if that one person thinks you're attacking them, et cetera, there's going to be a lot more anger. But if it's, you know, the surprise audit is randomly in each function of the environment, it's going to be taken a lot better. But I find it funny that uh, surprise, shock, and anger is, that's the biggest uh, reaction I get to fraud after it occurs. Yeah, and then usually that's because of, uh, usually frauds from a monetary standpoint don't have a, 
a material impact on the organizations that we've seen. Um, but the surprise and anger, uh, in, in my opinion, and Dave, you're, I'd love to hear your thoughts, are usually a result of a betrayal of trust. Yeah, there's a relationship there that's built between uh, employees and coworkers. And, you know, the biggest anger a lot of times is between the payroll clerks or people that work alongside you that, you know, this is a company we're working for, we're working for one goal. Um, you know, it could be quite a bit of money. It could have an impact. A lot of people have insurance, et cetera, that will cover that, et cetera. But um, the big, biggest anger I felt is between you know, employees that really don't get affected by the bottom line other than, you know, they get paid. Um, so that's kind of my feeling on it. Um, I agree. And I think that segues well into our next topic, which is, you know, has to do with that, that betrayal of trust. It's important to note that when companies experience fraud and they, you know, they react badly, they're upset, they, they've been betrayed by an employee who's taken from them. It's important to note that the the, dil, the diligence of the organization in going back and auditing people is really a responsible and positive approach. It's, well, we care enough to make sure that the right things are being done so that the organization is successful and everybody in the company can be successful. If the company isn't successful, then people lose jobs, bad things happen. Um, and that, that responsibility to hold people accountable at lower levels for the, the work that they're doing is, is vital to the support of the organization and its success. Um, that being said, maintaining and developing culture, which is very similar to, is related to governance, is vital to the success of surprise audits and the success of the organization. You want to set a clear expectation in the company that surprise audits may occur. You just don't want to drop these on people. As you saw in the, the previous poll, you know, 60% of people said, It'd be a surprise, but they take it in stride. Um, but then we're looking at the other 40% who would have some level of awe, anger, or they would be revolted by the surprise audit. Um, and these things, so setting expectations is not only good because it makes sure that everybody knows what's going to happen and how it's going to happen, but as we stated before, surprise audits can be a, a very strong preventative measure. If people know that they might be surprised audited, they're going to be a lot more likely to make sure that they're doing the right stuff all the time and not just cleaning things up at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter or just before an audit occurs. Um, normally, audits are planned and time is scheduled, so we need to set the expectation in the company that you know we're going to have some audits that aren't scheduled. They, they're scheduled, but you don't know when. Um, surprise audits create a we versus them mentality. Uh, I need, you need to manage that. You need to communicate and clarify frequently that, you know, hey, audits are, these audits and these reviews are part of a process to improve and protect the company and its employees. Uh, it's not a we versus them. It's an us together making sure that everything is being done right and in a good way. Um, and I think that's a key aspect to being successful from an internal audit perspective and from a fraud audit perspective. Uh, communicate the approach early and often, and then do it again to minimize cultural impact later. Uh, most most companies under communicate by a factor of ten, which means that they could probably communicate about ten times more than they do about things. It's tough in this day and age because I don't know about you, but I get plenty of emails on a daily basis, and it's tough to prioritize. Um, but it's uh, one more thing to communicate and training is key to the success of this as well as frequent communications and uh, explanations. Additional culture uh, considerations. You have to set expectations at all levels to do the right things. As Dave mentioned earlier, and rightly so, governance is key to the success in this area. If it's not coming from the top, it's very unlikely to be well supported at lower levels. Um, Instigating change from the bottom up is is a tough row to hoe uh, anytime. Um, and setting those expectations across the board is key from the board on down. Um, you, we don't want people just doing things right before an audit. If you do your job, a review at any time should reveal a few issues, right? Um, if you, I, I use children as a great example because um, they're easy to pick on. Uh, 
and we have all either been a child or have children. Um, if anybody has not either been a child or had children, uh, please let me know in the comment or question section. Uh, but you know, it's the reality with kids. If they know what's expected of them and they know that they can be checked on at any time, they have a tendency to do the right thing more often than not. And it's the same with employees and people need to be reminded. Um, I was once told that a CEO is also a chief reminder officer. You know, are you doing the right things? And re reminding people of these things is key. Uh, live and die by the sword. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If a surprise audit is good for one area of the company, then surprise audits are good for any area of the company. Um, while you may focus surprise audits in specific areas, high risk areas, um, I, I would encourage you to consider communicating and leveraging the fact that, and say, hey, you know, but we could do a surprise audit in any area at any time. If we think that someone's slacking off, we can do a surprise audit and we'll review it and report it back to the board and to senior management to make sure that the right stuff is being done. Again, that preventative measure, whether you're preventing fraud or just preventing sort of shoddy work, um, that can be beneficial to the organization. Because what you don't want to do is create a culture of exception where only one group is is taking it on the chin um, because then they're ready all the time and they're doing all their work and you might have other segments that are a little more lax and now you have competing cultures within the organization. You have a, a culture of professionals and, and competence and possibly a culture where, you know, well, we don't have to be up to speed and get everything right all the time because, well, we don't get audited by surprise. We have a chance to prep and, uh, the inconsistency and you want to make sure you're maintaining consistency of treatment across the board uh, for the strength of your organization. And it'll, it'll help everybody to maintain a high bar of performance. Uh, presentation, when you present a, a surprise audit, make sure you're presenting and explaining the reason and purpose for the surprise audit to the attendees. You know, lots of clarification and communication, as we mentioned. Um, we want to clarify that the purpose is not to punish, but to check up on improve. Uh, again, what, what internal audit and management understands as the purpose of internal audit may not be what auditees perceive. Um, I've just noticed that mismatch in expectation or perception. Uh, maybe other people have as well. <laughs> Dave's shaking his head. Um, and represent the importance of checking the processes given the risk assessment. It's, uh, you know, here we are in this department. We're here for a reason. We we didn't just pick you out of a hat. Uh, you're a high risk area. You know, you process 80% of the outgoing funds. You have access to checking accounts and uh, electronic transfers. Uh, this is high risk. We worry about it. We want you. We want to work with you to make sure that all the right things are being done to protect the company and these assets and make sure that. None of you are going to get in trouble for doing something that was inappropriate or get blamed for something else. All right, we have, a, we have a question. How do you get management to understand the importance of surprise audits if they are not a good leader in this respect? I have experienced this in the past as an internal auditor and it was frustrating. Um, that's a great question. Um, it has to do with a couple of different things. As an internal auditor, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this question from the internal auditor perspective. So let me rephrase it, and then I'll answer it. So, as an internal auditor, how do you get management to understand the importance of surprise audits? Um, and the answer to that is uh, communication, exclamation, explanation, and training uh, to the best of your ability to educate them and make them aware of the benefits and and how surprise audits can really support the success of the organization. Now, the reason I frame it from the perspective of an internal auditor is because ultimately it's internal audits job to recommend strategies to mitigate risk and to perform audits in certain ways in conjunction with management. But ultimately, management is on the hook for the successful operation of the company. So from an internal audit perspective, it is our job to be consultants and advisors and to help manage risk 
after management has made decisions about how they're going to manage risk. So we assess and make recommendations. But ultimately, management's on the hook. And it, making sure that you separate the responsibility between those two roles is key. Um, I recognize the frustration that can occur when you know that something is good and people aren't doing it. Um, but the next step is to say, well, you know, maybe they have other reasons for doing that, or maybe it's just not time for them to to recognize the benefits of that, or maybe maybe there aren't resources available. Whatever the case may be, they're then responsible for that decision. And then as an internal auditor, you move on and, may, and you bring it up again next year. Uh, I think it comes back to a previous slide we have, ident identifying the risks. You know, does management, are we really providing management the risks that could occur? You know, that the risks that, you know, might prevent or, or might lead to a fraud. Um, you know, if we're doing that correctly and we're providing, uh, you know, mitigation um, solutions to those risks, I think, and we can make it, you know, hey, this happens, you possibly could, you know, lose this much, you know, kind of put it in a financial perspective. You know, management a lot of times will see internal control and they don't, you know, it doesn't affect the bottom line. But, you know, what you know, make it affect the bottom line. You know, what are the risks? What could happen? You know, how much is this mitigation going to cost? You know, it's it's like buying insurance. You know, what, when, when do you need it really? Right. And and a follow-up to that, you know, there's there's some other considerations um, and just a comment that came through, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll weave into this, which is a note that internal audit also has the power to say, if the audit committee, if internal audit goes to the audit committee and says, we should be doing surprise audits in these areas, and the audit committee says, yeah, we should do that, then internal audit now has the authority of the board to go and do that activity. Um, and that's my phone ringing. Um, the, so that, that responsibility for management to choose is fine, but again, internal audit can have the authority uh, depending on internal audits perception of that risk and their willingness to push it up to the audit committee uh, to to implement surprise audits because they feel that it's an important aspect of risk mitigation within the company. Uh, another question we have here, what are some best practices for sharing the results of surprise audits? It is, it, is it important to share the results with the individuals, departments that are being audited? Yeah, absolutely. Surprise audits, as I mentioned earlier, the the process of a surprise audit it really does not differ from a standard audit, except for the amount of time that, of notice that you give to your auditees. Uh, you want to show up and say, hey, we're doing a surprise audit. Uh, we want information. Um, I don't think I, I mentioned this earlier, but on a previous slide, basically you want to show up and say we're doing a surprise audit, and then you want to request and gather any documentation that you have concerns about being change or manipulated right then and there. That way it's a true assessment of the operational effectiveness and state of that department. Um, so yeah, you want to you want to share positives and negatives of any internal audit report with your auditees as well as management, whether it's a regular internal audit uh, engagement or if it's a surprise internal audit engagement. You don't want to you don't want to change that process because it uh, it's going to create a different expectation about what surprise audits look like. And you want the, you want the audit process to be standard, except for the notification. Some are planned, some just happen, and that's the way it goes. Uh, we have another question. Do you feel that it is important for the results to not only be shared with the management of that area, but also with the employees that it directly affects? Yeah, same. Uh, I believe I just answered that question, and yes, absolutely. Um, again, going back to the purpose of internal audit, the purpose is to evaluate and improve. If you don't communicate your findings, what was good and what was not so good, areas for improvement and areas that looked effective, how can employees, supervisors, managers, management, and even the board know what they need to fix or what they need, just need to keep doing that's effective? So. Um, Definitely very, very important for sharing across the board. Transparency and accountability, all good things. Uh, how do we deal with managers that don't want to hand over information at the start of a surprise audit? Do you have any funny stories? Um, yeah, there, 
I mean, building relationships as an internal auditor is key to getting proper cooperation for the internal audit process. Um, dealing with managers that don't want to hand over information at the start of a surprise audit, uh, that, that will depend on your organization, the relationship you have with that manager, and the status of the internal audit department within an organization. Uh, you obviously don't want to pull out the internal audit charter that says you have access to all information at all times and then pick up the phone and dial the committee chair of the audit committee and have him talk to the manager. You know, that, that might be a little heavy handed. Um, on the other hand, down at the spectrum, you don't want to walk out and say, OK, well, just let us know when we can have that stuff. Uh, I don't have too many funny stories about that. Um, in general, my approach has been the few times that people have pushed back and said, well, we don't have time to provide those files to you. Um, a great response is to say, well, the whole audit team is here. Why don't you just show us where the files are? We'll pull our samples ourselves. You know, we won't create a burden for you. We're here to be a solution. So we'll pull that stuff. Uh, we have access to your system. We'll pull the files. We'll get the copies. And we appreciate you just pointing us in the right direction. So you want to they're going to offer roadblocks. Well, we don't have time. We don't have resources. We don't. We don't want to give it to you. And then, if you have to move it up the chain, you you have to move it up the chain and say, okay, well, we understand that surprise audits can be uh, difficult. Um, if you'd like to speak to my supervisor, we can get him down here. Uh, if you want to speak to his supervisor, we can get her down here, um, and and just continue to escalate it until everyone understands what the purpose is and that you have a job to do as they do and come to some agreement. Um, and you want to want to manage that to the best of your ability. Uh, we want to maintain consistency. Again, we, we already talked about this. The only, the only difference is surprise and information gathering. Um, and we want to be factual and clear about the approach. All right, we have one last poll. Wrap things up. Do you think surprise audits may be a good fit for your company? Yes, absolutely. Yes, but we need to do some groundwork. Maybe I'll be talking to someone else about this. No, it doesn't fit our business or culture. And again, going back to risk assessment, you know, sometimes things work in an environment, sometimes they don't. Um, and it's important to evaluate whether or not it works. I need to exercise more, but I know that I'm never going to take up running. So I didn't buy myself a pair of jogging shoes. These are key things. Dave's getting ready for his first marathon. Right, Dave? Exactly. Yeah. Two days. Two days. Great. Just joking. I'll have the, amb <laughs> I'll have the ambulance following you. <laughs> All right, we got some results. Uh, about 30, about 40% actually say, yeah, you're ready for some surprise audits. Let's do it. 25% uh, said, yeah, we need to do some groundwork first, but we're ready. 18% maybe. Uh, let's talk about it. And 20% now doesn't really fit our environment. And it, I, one of the reasons I put this poll question here is, so you're thinking about it. Um, and maybe if it doesn't fit your culture now, maybe it will in the future. Maybe if it fits your culture now, it will not in the future. But evaluating it and assessing it so you can make decisions about it later after things have changed, or maybe nothing has changed, the reassessment is vital so that you can make, uh, make good choices after your reassessment. Uh, we have one last comment. Um, Vicki believes they're a good fit for every organization. Um, so if Vicki is your internal auditor, uh, just be aware that she's coming for you. Um, <laughs> I'm sure she will do an excellent job. All right, we're running short on time here. We've had some good questions and polls. Um, and we're, this is the last slide. Some next steps just to wrap things up. Uh, assess risks in your environment. We talked about that. General risks and fraud risks. And you have to document this stuff so you can communicate it and share it with other people. If you don't document your risk assessment, uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, it helps for clear communication. Consider areas for surprise audits. Again, that's part of your risk assessment and your audit plan. Communicate to everybody that surprise audits are a possibility. Let everybody know that they'll be checked up on at any time. You don't just have to do your job right before an audit or a review. You have to do your job right every day. Communicate the importance of doing things right at the right time and verification of activities to perform comfort to management. You know, yeah, we trust you. How do you know we trust you? Because you still work here. I mean, the reality is 
if you're not a trusted employee, you don't last very long in an organization. People don't keep untrusted people in the organization. Um, especially, and I'm talking about truly untrusted. Like you look at that guy, I don't trust him. You know, normally they, they work their way out of an organization. You're trusted, you're here, but we still need to check and make sure you're doing the right stuff. And then maintain a consistent approach for all audits, except for the timing and the collection of requested items. You still want to have the same approach, the same structure, so that everyone can compare audits and results across the board and have clear expectations about what's going to happen. That's about it for us. Uh, we've wrapped it up here in just under an hour. Dave, do you have any other parting comments? I think the bottom line with our um, presentation today is we want to mitigate the risks and lessen the opportunity. You know, it comes down to when we start is, you know, do they have the opportunity? Do they think they have the opportunity? Whether or not they have it or not, do they think they have it? You know, and if we can lessen that opportunity, uh, we'll be better off. Absolutely. Managing the perception is key. And uh, Dave, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll take any lingering or last minute questions right now. Otherwise, you're welcome to contact us at our email addresses here, um, or you can give us a call. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions, or if you have any thoughts, more than help, happy to talk to you. Hope you enjoyed the webinar, and if there are no further questions, we will call it a day, and we hope you have a great afternoon. We'd like to thank you once again for joining us for this presentation presented by McConley and Asbury, Certified Public Accountants. We hope you join us and participate in our upcoming events. You can stay up to date with news and learn about our upcoming events by visiting us online at www.macpas.com. Thank you again and have a great day.